Wow. As always with my Facebook feeds, it says there's six people watching and I only see one on my Facebook page. So like when it shows it in the feed, I can never ever tell in live time who's on, who's not. It's it's a weird dynamic with Facebook. Yeah, I think I think they probably don't have like that technology set up correctly. Yet. Yeah, it's weird because I will get questions after that people say they were on there and I'm like, I didn't even see you pop in and, and so on. So that's kind of cool, but. Cool, right. so we're ready to go. I'm ready, you shoot. <laughs> All, right. <laughs> All right, thank you for everyone joining us today. Um, we have Shihan Ali Abarigo here from Long Island Ninjutsu Centers in New York. Uh, Shihan Ali, um, you know, I'll let him introduce himself, but you know, Shihan Ali, I, I've looked up to him for many years. Uh, I've known him for many years now. Um, you know, he, he's been in the Nimpo martial arts for 30 years now. Uh, just a plethora of, of knowledge. You know, you look so young, though. Uh, I, I say 30 years, but you look you look like a young guy. Well, thank you for that. That's something good to know. <laughs> so, um, so yeah, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, yeah. Give the audience uh, some background on your, on your yeah, of course. arts. And your, well, your well, thank you for the compliment as far as my age and how I look. It's all about lighting and, and makeup and hair, right? That's what right. they always do now. But uh, yeah, I've been I've been doing the martial arts for 52 years this year. 52 years. Can you imagine? Um, people will say to me, and often when I say that, when I'm in my school and I'm saying, "Hey, I've been doing it this long," they go, "Nah, they don't believe me," and and I feel flattered by that. Um, but uh, yeah, I started when I was three. Um, I didn't start. My parents put me in it. My mom from Malta, the you know in the Mediterranean Sea, and and my dad. Um, an Italian guy was born up in the, in the city in Astoria, Queens, but also a police officer. So we lived on Long Island. Um, and my dad, during that time period in the 70s, um, people didn't like police officers all that much. Uh, it's similar to kind of like now. Um, they feared them and respected them in the 70s, but nowadays they just don't respect them or fear them today, right? Um, but my dad thought like, hey, listen, everyone's going to find out that I'm a cop. I want my kid. He's little. He's tiny. I want him to learn how to defend himself. So at about three and a half years old, my dad brought me to a place called Jerome Mackey. It was the first franchise martial arts school that was out there. Um, he had many locations. He had a TV commercial on and um, he was quite famous, made a lot of money. So my dad brought me to the school and the instructor said, listen, we don't take kids until they're like 11 or 12. So my dad pulled the cop influence and says, listen, if you take care of my son, you know, I'll, I'll take care of you guys and vice versa if you don't, you know, like, so they said, okay, we'll take him in. And then my mom, being the tough European, said, and I don't want him to get any special privileges. Um, and so, like, as just imagine as a three-year-old, I was training with 10-year-olds and adults, 13, 12-year-olds and adults, you know. And um, they would kick the crap out of me some days. And then my mom would say, hey, I told your sensei that you didn't listen to me at home. I mean, just imagine I'm three and a half, four years old. Right. Um, I attained my first black belt in that school at around 1972 it was a junior kids black belt. They've never done it before. They said, Hey, we're just going to reward him. He's been training for like seven years. Um, and they did the right thing. They kind of gave me like what they call the junior black belt. I still wore the same colors on my belts, but they had stripes and things like that. Um, but um, I started ninjutsu in probably around 1980 after training in Aikido getting a black belt then going into the Filipino martial arts training under a world-renowned knife fighter uh, Tuhan Chris Sayak of the Sayak Kali Sayak fighting system um, in fact he actually lived with me at my home for a year and a half it was the coolest experience that wow. I ever had where he just one day was knocking on my door. He says, I, I'm going to stay with you. And I'm like, I asked my mom and my mom said, okay. And it was only supposed to be for two weeks. It ended up being like a year, a year and a half or a year. And um, he'd wake me up at two in the morning. He'd have me climbing trees, shooting arrows at me, like the true Mr. Miyagi stories that, that, you, that you'd crazy. see on a karate movie. <laughs> that was crazy. And uh, yeah, I bonded with him like, like you could never imagine. He's no longer with us. And my heart is empty because I miss him. I think about him quite often. And, um, it, what an experience. And all along, though, in the 80s, I wanted to be a ninja. Everyone did. I'm sure you did. We watched Ninja, you know, Revenge of the Ninja, Enter the Ninja, Ninja Assassin. Every Chuck Norris movie had a ninja in it. I'm like, I want to be that guy in the black hood. I bought the hood and the uniform and the weapons that you could buy through the magazines. I'd run around my neighborhood and hide in bushes and all stupid <laughs> stuff like that. 
Um, and then I met my teacher, Sean Felix Vasquez, who was an American ninjutsu practitioner. Um, I'd see him at tournaments, insanely disciplined martial artists, very hard to get near, um, to talk to, had a whole entire process of people around him that would always protect and isolate him from the crowds. And I somehow made my way into his community and eventually started training with him. And he was, he was taught by Professor Ronald Duncan, world-renowned uh, American ninjutsu practitioner. Um, I then moved on to meeting, um, you know, uh, Tanimura Sensei from Japan through a seminar that we all went to. First, it was with Stephen Hayes, um, and then I met him uh, at a seminar, and it was quite amazing. And then I started trying to get to train in Japan. Like one time, I said uh, in Japanese, I tried to say it before I could speak anything. I asked Tanimura Sensei, "Can I come?" And he said, "Yeah." And he signed a picture and handed it to me. He thought I wanted to buy a picture, so and he said ten dollars. So I paid him for the picture. And um, then I tried again at another seminar. Finally, after like two or three seminars, he said, you can come to Japan. And then I went with a group of people. And from then on, I trained with him for 17 trips to Japan, traveled around the world, Italy. Um, uh, I went to England multiple times, different, just had him in for Taikais in New York. So I would go there for two to three weeks at a time, sometimes twice a year to Japan live there and then come home and teach and go back again and um, rose from you know the ranks of uh, whatever to six dawn under him and um you know kept on training with him until i decided to go out and you know and not um and then that's really about it so that's my history of me doing the martial arts so you get a little bit of a brand you know i've trained with other masters like i train in multiple seminars with steven seagal um, and other teachers and, and so on. So it's pretty, pretty cool life that I've lived so far. Yeah, that sounds amazing. Um, and I can't imagine like you're, you're rambling off all these experiences and all these trips to Japan. And uh, I had a conversation with, uh, uh, with one of my students and uh, the other day, and they were, they were saying, you know, how, uh, you know, martial arts is expensive, you know? Yeah. I think our students have it pretty easy that yeah. we're only charging them, you know, 200 bucks a month or, or whatever, you know, Absolutely. Um, because I've probably spent over a hundred thousand dollars in my own training. Yeah. You know, I, and you're rambling off all these, all these crazy things. I, yours is probably. Well, I'll, I'll tell you a funny more. story. Um, at any time and every time I made a wire transfer of money, to Tanimura Sensei and or a plane ticket or uh, travel to another place in the United States, I'd take the bills and I'd put them in an envelope, a folder, file folder in my drawer. One day I said, hey, let me just kind of figure this out. And I, I got through like a tenth, a tenth of the pile of receipts and it was around 160,000 at wow. a tenth. So I'm thinking that probably close to a million dollars went into my training. Right. Um, but I looked at it like this, like, you know, sometimes, um, you know, I'd, I'd speak to people, they go, wow, you spent so much money. And I go, yeah, but if I went to college, I would probably have spent, you know, $30,000, you know, a year, three, four years, you're looking at the same kind of experience where I invested back into my own future and my own education. So to me, it was money well spent. And then anytime I learned something, or I got a new degree, I came back and shared it with my students. So I was able to continue to teach and be better for it. So yeah, it, it cost me a fortune, but every every penny well spent. Yeah, it's like, it's almost like, you know, you are, you know, you have a master's degree. Right. You know, or a doctorate even. Yeah. In what, we, in what you're doing, right? Because of yeah. all, the, all the training and all the, and I think some people don't get that. You know, I mean, yeah. they don't understand that. You know, when they look at, you know, a hundred bucks a month or 150 bucks right. a month or 200 right. bucks a month, they're like, you know, why? Well, this is why. Well, you know, you know what's interesting? Let's let's stay on this topic for a second so that, you know, the people who are listening as students or parents that may listen to this interview um, can get a little bit of a different perspective on it. Right. So, so we no longer look at successful people as people we want to emulate or be like or follow after. Our society has become a call out society where we tend to want to drag down those people that are successful. Like for example, you know, uh, Hollywood celebrities are just Hollywood celebrities. They're meaningless and they don't really do anything. This is the, you know, and, and who cares what they have to say? What they're masters at their craft, right? They've worked so hard to do what they do. They don't claim, some of them claim to, you know, to know about politics and all other stuff, 
but they're masters at what they do. Um, and that's why they get so much money for what they do, right? They, it's like a basketball player. You know, I, I get it. They're, the, the paychecks are inflated. They're insanely larger than they probably should be, yeah. but they're the best of the best, right? Like they're, they've worked at a craft so much to become experts, right? You don't have a, like the NBA doesn't have a league in between that's called the mediocre league. And everybody, you know, every five shots they shoot, they, you know, they get one in, you know, they're the masters of it, right? So right. people tend to not really appreciate mastership, right? So like even a parent, they, they pay you, let's just pretend it's a hundred dollars a month. They feel that they've bought the service of a hundred dollars a month. And your job is to teach their kids, literally share life experiences that will change their lives for a hundred bucks a month. And, and that's what we do. We honestly right. do that. But um, it's more appreciated as a commodity. Like, like, you know, I bought some broccoli at a supermarket. It was two bucks and I got my broccoli. Like, it's not the same. Right. I'll give you another example. Like, I, I have a student who's kind of struggling right now. He's an ex-cop, was one of my first black belts I ever promoted in the 90s. Um, he became a police officer, retired on three-quarter pension, and he's been struggling with this whole coronavirus thing. And so he reaches out to me and we've chatted and he's having a hard time with it. But he said to me one thing that I thought was very profound. He said, Shion, well, he calls me sensei because that's when he knew me, right? I was a sensei. And he said, sensei, you've literally saved my life multiple times. You, you know, you saved my life on the job against people I had to defend myself against. You saved my life when I was depressed and, you know, didn't know what to do when things happened on the job. You saved my life now. And, and you know, I thought about that. I said, now, what is that worth in, in money? Like if you could say to a parent, maybe my lessons or your lessons will change your child's life forever. Like it might, it might keep them away from drugs. It might make them stay out of a gang. It might teach them how to persevere when they're getting bullied or um, they have depression or sadness in their lives or through a breakup or through a, a missed opportunity at your job, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so these are the things that martial arts, you can't put a price tag on. And that's why I think martial arts schools are probably the best places to be that you could ever be because they do oh, yeah. so much more. I think we do a better job than most psychiatrists, you know what I mean? Or, you know, uh, or shrinks or whatever, you know what I mean? I think, yeah. um, you know, we're, we're keeping kids uh, active, you know, yeah. we're teaching them self-respect, confidence and all these things, you know, and we're cheaper than a psychiatrist or a shrink, you know what I mean? Yeah, so, yeah. Um, well, speaking of helping people, the same time I was speaking at four, four of my tabs open on my Facebook messenger and four different people were coming from me to me for advice on how to push themselves through. Most of them are, are not my students any longer, but they're lifelong students. They still look up to me. These are people who trained and moved away or quit and still look at me in a certain way. Um, another one was saying to me, I'm having a real struggle with life. It was pretty deep and dark. And I said, where are you? He says, I'm in a drug rehabilitation center right now. I'm in a program. I don't know what they call it, a 10 step or 12 step or 20. Like, but he's in it right now. And who's he reaching out to? Me for advice. He's got psychologists, I'm sure like experts around him in the place, but he's still coming to me for some clarity on what they're telling him and how he should act. So if, you, if that's in, not enough in itself for like a parent to realize or a student to realize how lucky they are to have a sensei, a good one, like there are a lot of charlatans out there that shouldn't be teaching martial arts in my opinion. Um, uh, but they're the good ones out there. They're unbelievable. Like they're life changers. They're un saviors. They're sages in, in right. many respects. Right. Um, so let's talk about your time, uh, you know, uh, with uh, your both ninjutsu teachers. So um, Sensei Felix and then uh, Tanamura Sensei. Like yeah. what what was your training like back then, you know, in, in Japan and with Felix and, you know, uh, yeah. tell everyone, because I think sometimes when I, I, I tell people what my training, I believe your training was way harder than mine, right? right, right. As, okay. as time goes on, I think the training gets easier for people. Yeah. And when I tell people what my training was like, they think I'm blowing smoke. Right. You know what I mean, so I could only imagine what your training was like. Yeah, well, well, there's two extreme differences from my American ninjutsu training to my Japanese ninjutsu training, right? And I find it's interesting that the people that are not from Japan or, or other countries, even the traditional Korean arts or Chinese arts, we came back and brought the martial arts back to the United States with some understanding that a black belt was a superhuman person, right? Um, 
my teacher, Shion Vasquez, trained us like we were superhuman. Like we literally, if you want, uh, I'll put up a link and have you share it, but you could go back and watch a video of me, Uke, and being a partner from my teacher um, during a demo that I put up called Old School Martial Arts. And he literally is beating the living crap out of us. And when I say this, it's not like a beating that you would think. It's a beating where people after the demonstration would come up and open up our uniforms and say, what are you padding are you wearing? Because he would hit us full blast with pipes and sticks. I mean, there's parts of the video where he punches me as hard as he can in the throat. I mean, I've had, had my nose broken three times by training with him and by him and in the classes. Um, you know, we would fully fight on like a floor that's not matted. It was like a linoleum tile that had broken sections. We had one mat in our school that we would dive roll on and it was so old that it had holes in it. So we would try to hit the area that had a little iota of padding left in it. <laughs> right. So, and when I say that people don't believe it, but many, many of my students could easily go on here because that's how I taught. And many of them would come with me and train there as well. Um, because I started off in my dojo with no mats on a hardwood floor. We'd take full ukemi, shoulder throws, ipon seonage on a hardwood floor. And parents would never complain. Like my, they would have their kids training with me and they wouldn't even question it. Like they would, they would knew that it was hardcore because in their mind they were preparing strong individuals. Right. Nowadays it's totally different, but we could get into that in a second. But my training was brutal. Uh, but then again, let me also say that there was a part of me that kind of thought like there was a gentler way to be able to do that as well. Even though my mindset was to teach like my teacher taught me. I mean, I even taught in a Spanish accent when I talked. You know, just imagine, I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm technically as white as you could ever be. But when I taught in my Long Island school, I'd be like, you know, man, you got to you got to throw the punch this way and you're tucking your shin, you know, like and and. I, I'd hear, I watch videos of myself and I cringe, but that's how I trained in that environment in, in, in Ridgewood, Queens on Myrtle Avenue with all Latinos. Most of them spoke Spanish. Um, I was like, everyone thought I was Latino because that's who I hung around with. That's, you know, that's all I did. Um, so, so I taught like he taught me to teach, but then I met Tani Muda Sensei and I saw that he was able to put the pain on. But then like one day he took me in a wrist lock, first experience, and he put me in this wrist lock, I hit the ground. And then he rubbed my wrist and smiled and, and made sure I was okay and then walked away. And I was like, you know what? I wanna be with a guy like that, that could put the pain and hurt on me like that um, and still care and love me in the same respect. Show me that, right? So I wanted to be that kind of teacher. Um, anyway, so, so that's really where I kind of asked my teacher, Shan Bass was, can I travel to Japan? And he said, yes. He said, just as long, he go, yes, Papa, as long as you bring the information back to me, you know, like that in his Spanish accent. And, um, and I did. And uh, for years I trained with him and then I just got so involved with Tanimura Sensei, it was less and less time with Shion Vasquez, more time going to Japan. But we still to this day, oh, Sensei Vasquez and I are super close. Like when he needs me, he calls me, he needs something, he calls me um, and I'm there for him. I love him. I'll do anything for him. And, um, and, and that's the way it is. So yeah, it was brutal back then. Even my teacher, Chuhan Sayak, it was brutal back then. Like I said, he, he'd wake me up in the middle of the night and he'd have me break down my fears. He'd ha I was afraid of heights. So he'd make me climb a tree in my backyard and then climb down upside down. And then he'd make me climb off of the thin branch. And if the branch broke, he'd say, just roll out. Like, and I'd be scared to death and I'd freeze and he'd shoot arrows at me. No joke, arrows with live tips. And one time I got shot in the leg and I'm in the tree with the lat, it's stuck in my knee. And I, he's like, pull it out, I'm shooting another one. And he, he, I pulled it out, he shot another one and I dived out of the tree, Hapo Tenchi Tobi landed and rolled out. Right. So, I mean, the training was unbelievable, but I don't believe people in today's society, there's a very tiny portion of people that would subject themselves to that now. Yeah. I, uh, I tell my students when I started martial arts, I told them, I was like, we didn't have mats. So when we got thrown, we got thrown on the hardwood floor. Yeah. And uh, that's why I'm very good at ukemi now because you yeah. know, that to me is like having a bed, you know? Exactly. Um, but uh, I, uh, I had some recent students uh, like a few months ago, like maybe like five of them yeah. uh, leave the school uh, because um, they were the type of students that would, uh, they wouldn't take training seriously. Right. Um, and they would joke around a lot when uh, they were in class. And I, and I warned them uh, and I'm like, Hey, if you don't take this seriously, I'm not, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna really, you know, 
te uh, really teach you. I'm not going to show you anything new. We're just going to keep right. going over, right. you know, your Q level material, things like that. So they left the school. They quit because mm -hmm. I wasn't showing them any new stuff. And right. I was like, and I, and I told them like, you know, you don't deserve any new stuff if, yeah. if you're, if you don't care. Right. Yeah. You, you have to earn it. And that's what I think people don't understand that. Yeah. Is the type of training our, our training is so special. NIMPO is so special that, you know, you just don't get it just because you pay a service. Yeah. Yeah. You know what? There's a lot, there's so much to what you just said. And, you know, we probably have to extend this interview by like two or three hours, but I'll quickly briefly go over like, so, so, um, that's the way people think now, right? Unfortunately, they don't quite get it, right? There's an old saying in the military, you don't know what you don't know, right? So what that means simply is that if you don't know it, you can't understand it. So when we talk about the old days or we talk about how real training is and they, they can't even conceptualize what that means because they, they don't have any point of reference whatsoever, right? So it's almost like saying, you know, uh, I don't know, a magician shows a trick and it's just sleight of hand, but people think it's real that something just disappeared in, in you know, thin air when really there's a science to it, right? So, so we, we have to be really crafty. And this is how I stayed successful in the martial arts all these years, because I understood that I had to baby step people into what we do. I had to slightly shift their mindset into what we do. And I knew that only a small portion of my people would truly get it. And when I say truly get it, the inner teachings, you know, the, the ura kyo, the, the spiritual inside. Um, but, you know, I knew that I was going to teach a mass of people. Let's just say I taught 400 people. I probably think that 40 to 60 of them would be in the inner circle. Right. That really, truly got it, right? And, um, and some of those people would surprise you as well, where you go, I thought they got it. And then two days later, they quit on you or turn on you. So you have to kind of be careful about, you know, what our expectations are because people just don't live in that society anymore. They don't live like I did growing up fighting. And even though I went to a, a very good school, I lived in a really good town. I still fought my entire life. Like I was always bullied, um, but I could fight. So people would pick on me and get the crap kicked out of them. Um, you know, other than a kid, a poor kid who gets picked on, who feels like they can't do anything about and just gets abused. So, I mean, I've had probably through my days from elementary school to high school, probably had about 60 to 65 actual street fights. Um, and when I say street fights, I mean like really pounding someone and bloody mess and one kid gives up and you walk away um, and uh, that kind of thing. So I fought a lot, was suspended a lot. My mom was always in the principal's office, but my mom was the problem. My dad wasn't. My dad would yell at me. My mom would say, did, did the person deserve it? And I'd go... Yeah, they started with me. She says, okay, then then just stay home for two days. You know, that's it. And you go back. Like she didn't, she she lived with like the street rules. Like you mess with someone, you get you get a whooping. You know, that was her mindset. My dad was a cop. It was always about, you know, whether I did anything wrong to provoke it or whether I was bad and that's why they hit me first, you know, that kind of thing. So, but yeah, we got we have a different lifestyle now. People are softer. Um, and I don't say that in a negative way. We have every creature comfort that we could possibly have, right? We, we, we have every, anything we want. If you don't want to give it to him, sensei, then I'll go on the internet and look it up. And if he, if I can't find it, I'll go to a different guy and I'll just, there's none of that loyalty or what they call in Japanese giddy, like that honor, that dedication, that, you know, undivided, undenying devotion to your sensei or your parents or people that have done stuff for you. Right. No, yeah, I, I agree. And uh, going, uh, you know, steering the conversation towards your schools, um, you know, you have, you still have two locations, correct? Yeah, yeah. And I've been to one of them. Yeah. Um, and I tell you, like, I always knew you had beautiful locations because judging from the pictures, and but, you know, right. I went for the first time last year to visit you and stuff. And it was just like, the pictures don't do it justice. Well, thank uh, you. Yeah, Thank you. It, your students have no idea how lucky they are, especially that you teach NIMPO. Yeah. In this beautiful location or right. two beautiful locations, really. Yeah. You know, because NIMPO schools to actually have a physical location there and are not just training out of like a gym hall, you know, right. it's super rare. Yeah. Know? So yep. um, let's talk about that. Like, why have you been so successful all these years and had? all this nice stuff for your students. 
Well, first, let me explain. Uh, my big school that you've been to is called the Hanata Dojo. In Japanese, that means flower garden, right? And I got the, every school that I ever opened, whether it was an affiliate school of mine, I would write a little description about what the school was, and I'd send it to Tanimura Sensei, and he'd give me a Japanese name. But when he came to my school to teach in, in, in Long Island there, he looked at the school and he said, oh my God, this is huge. It's like a flower garden. It's that big, you know, it's like a garden. So he called it Hanata. Another dojo I had upstate, I had a ranch in, in the mountains and he called it Hana En, like heaven's garden. Um, you know, so I, the Japanese names were like that. But, but listen, it's not, it's not an easy thing to run a martial arts school. You know this, it's not an easy thing. It'd be great to just be able to teach and have people pay, but there's a science to running a business and keeping it alive and running a martial arts school and not, um, not compromising your integrity of what you want to teach, right? right? So many people will sell out for the dollar and they'll commercialize for the dollar and they'll give up a lot of things that they believe in to kind of appeal to a certain clientele. Now here's the secret that I think one thing that I could share, I never did that and that's the secret, but I turned the brand of what I do into that very reason. So I was not known as the guy who would give belts just because. I was known as the guy who wouldn't give belts because, right? I was known as the guy who made people wear their uniform and people would curse me out and hate me and write bad things about me on. I had a parent, two parents, and believe it or not, it's the funniest story because the father was a linebacker for the New York Jets, a guy who probably had to listen to every rule in the book, wear your uniform, make sure you're always dressed and you know, make sure you act a certain way. And he refused, him and his wife refused to bring their kid prepared to class. And every time I said something, they'd laugh at me until I finally said, you can't do this anymore. And then they, the, the dad, six foot four linebacker in my lobby trying to threaten me. I want my money back. I'm like, okay, I don't care. I'll give you your money back, but you're not intimidating me. I don't care who you are and how big you are. You're gonna, you have to live by my rules. And, and if you probably go on my reviews, you'll find their reviews saying things like, how dare you make a kid cry over a stupid uniform? Or you just wanna sell more uniforms. I'm like, no, we gave you the uniform for free. I just want you to wear it. And I thought that maybe you would understand that right? right so anyway my brand is and by the way I've gotten more students out of that bad review than I've gotten probably scared away because parents are saying that's the kind of guy I want my kid training with that wants my kid to be disciplined that wants to stick to rules to teach my kid rules and regulations and um, so that was my brand I've been always the guy who's been traditional spiritual focused on a student's growth I didn't give in to parents' whim because they're threatening me that they're gonna withhold a paycheck or quit and go somewhere else. And I've always taught traditional martial arts in the way that I believe that they should be taught. And, and that's why I was a success. So that's how I've gotten all the things that I've gotten, if that's a short answer to, to your question. No, yeah, that's, that's a great answer. Um, I, and I think you and I think a lot alike. Um, so that's why like, I look up to you, Thank you. As, a, as a martial artist and a little bit of a mentor because you know i'm the same way i don't give in right I feel like it is and if they don't like it you know i'm sorry but you know i speak the truth i always yeah. speak the truth and you know i'm i'm never going to bs someone uh just because i want to make a buck no i'm i will tell you the truth this is how you know your kid's going to get disciplined this is right. how we're going to do it if you yeah. don't want to follow the rules then that's on you you know you can go somewhere else yeah. but you're you're not going to learn nimpo because the closest school that's teaching Nimpo to me, that's not in like some grungy gym hall is probably 35 miles from here. Right. And I think people don't understand that. Well, unfortunately, they don't know the difference, right? They don't, you could say to them, well, you're not going to learn Nimpo. And then you could have just said, you're not going to learn, you know, hamburger. Right. So them, it's, they don't really understand, right? And um, so that's the key is, is not only educating our clientele on why we're so special, Right. Because if not, it's just a point of reference. I have a funny story for you. So speaking of my school being a beautiful school, I once had a parent call me up. He's at my second location, which is like a little mini version. Uh, and I don't even say mini. It's still a 5,000 square foot training facility, outdoor archery ranges, obstacle courses, every ninja dream you could ever think of. Right. But he called me up one day. And he said, you know, hey, Shannon, can we have a talk? And I'm like, yeah, he goes, I want to talk to you about your lobby. And this is way before, this is years before this Corona thing ever happened. And he's like, you know, it's a little hot in your lobby in the summer. And, and uh, you know, I'm really not happy. And I, I kind of chuckled because I thought he was pulling my leg. And he goes, 
you know, do you understand customer service? And, you know, you know, how could you laugh when I'm trying? I said, oh, I thought you were joking, actually, you know, because he was complaining that it was a little warmer. And meanwhile, the door is opening and closing all day and it's hard to air condition it. So I said to him, I said, listen, I, I, I want to invite you to go to look at other schools. And he said, oh, you want me to take my son somewhere else? I said, no, I want you to look at other schools and see what they do and then come back to me and we could talk. Well, two weeks later, he came back and he said, listen, I've looked at other schools and I had no point of reference when I was complaining, um, but now I do and thank you for what you have and what you do and how you do it. Cause I've watched those schools. I've looked at those lobbies with the plastic lawn chairs and you know, you know, it was just, you know, no monitors, no, no, nothing, you know, no Wi-Fi, And you know, we, we just have a gorgeous, as you know, my lobby is like a Starbucks. Yes. You know, so he understood, but he had no point of reference. So that's a lot of the time where people say you want traditional NIMPO. They don't have a point of reference. They don't know. They think that we're all karate schools. We're all the same. And that's where certain schools need to really, really show their difference, their uniqueness. There's a book called The Purple Cow. Why does a purple cow stand out above all the other cows? Um, why are we different? Why is ninjutsu different? Why is, is a traditional marts, martial arts school different than a MMA school? You know what I mean? So we have to really teach people that. Yeah, I, I, I totally agree. Imagine if uh, you went to Tanamura Sensei at, at Hambu Dojo in Japan and say, right. hey, it, it's too hot in here. Right. <laughs> well, well, you know what? You Have you trained in the old dojo in Japan or did you only train in the new one? I only trained in the new one because the old one was demolished before I got right. there. So the old one was about two car length, two car garage size, right? And um, there was no air conditioner. There was one fan on the ceiling that would blow back and forth like this. And in the middle of June, when I was training, the windows would be open. We'd have a towel, wipe in the sweat, do technique, wipe again. We'd be dripping sweat. And it was brutal. And I loved every second of it. Like yeah. it was like, I'd look out the window overlooking the rice paddy that Tanimoto Sensei was growing. And um, to me, that's what ninjutsu was. I was in the land where it was invented. Like I got to train with the guy, you know, like it was one of two ninja masters in the entire world that did that really is the authority on this. And I was with one of them. So like I could care less if, if, if I would pass out from the heat because I was just so privileged and honored to be there. Like I would train on the tatami mats that he had were so hard at the time that my knees would be raw from, from doing suwari waza, like kneeling techniques, that I'd go back to my room, pull up my pants legs and let the fan blow on my kneecap so it would cr crust over in a scab. I know I'm being gross, but so that I could walk to, the, to get my food. Like so, but to me, that was just a blessing. Like, but, but I guess I'm a little demented, right? I guess most people like, most people are probably listening going, that doesn't sound like fun at all. Yeah. You know, that kind yeah. of thing. When, when, I, when I get pinned or in an arm lock or something, uh, Mark Sensei is always like, why are you smiling? Yeah. Like, and I, I'm like, I don't know. Like, you know, yeah. it's just one of those things, you know, um, I guess I like pain. I don't know. Yeah. Well, it's, it's cause we appreciate the essence of the move. Right. Um, and appreciate the pain that we can put on because we know it's real. So that's where some reality, again, it goes back to educating people, right? And that's where we have to train our students to almost know what to look for um, so that they can appreciate what we do. And that's why what we're doing, your art, my art, is so important to the world today. But we also realize that only a small segment of the population can appreciate that. Right. So that's, that's what we teach for. Uh, before we move on to our next uh, topic, um, if anybody wants to ask Shihan Ali a question, um, please feel free to comment below um, because we're almost we're almost done here. But uh, it was quick, right? Yeah. So, um, so like, uh, do you do you like the current state of ninjutsu or ninpo? And if if you don't, what would you change about it? Well, here, there was something, I think you started a group, right? That group that about ninjutsu and people started commenting. Um, I've always trained in, in, especially with being in the real martial arts with Shi Osensei Vasquez. So, so let's just say like it's an American ninjutsu system with the, with the Ronald Duncan, Shion Vasquez line but a very real deal self-defense art. So forget about what you call it if you look at the lineage and all that other stuff, but it was brutal. Like Shan Vasquez's guys were tough individuals. Like I would want them along my side, um, probably more so than a lot of the guys that trained in classical ninjutsu in Japan. 
there were some really good, you know, people who I trained with in Japan that were fierce fighters. Right. Um, but, um, but, but, but that's kind of how I was brought up. Right. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think I like, I like how the martial arts is, but I do think that a lot of ninjutsu practitioners, and I'm, I want to be kind of kind on this, that they probably couldn't fight their way out of a wet paper bag. Yes. Right. Like they don't, they've never done it. And it's not any fault to their own. They're so caught up in what Bruce Lee called the classical mess and learning how to do Ruha family, like technique, um, but never putting it into practical application. So on that post that you posted, I said, there are a lot of guys that don't even know how to throw a, a punch. They could do Jodan Uke and straight punch, but they've never really done that in a real fight. It's probably not how you're not, you're not going to fight an MMA guy like that. So you got to learn every aspect of fighting. And then you got to put it into Ron Dory. Ron Dory is practical application. Right. Um, and there's many variations of Ron Dory levels of it, right? Where, Maybe you do it in a controlled environment. Maybe you do it in a less controlled environment. Maybe you do it without any control and you get punched in the face trying to defend yourself and learn from it, right? And, and learn what hardcore training is. Because I, I know of many martial arts, I swear to God, I've seen a guy, a master of Aikido at a tournament once. I'd watch him for years gracefully flipping and throwing and pinning people. He got into an argument with a karate guy. They ended up getting into an actual fight. And I had to say that the Aikido guy was smacking like a little girl. In, like, and I don't want to insult girls, but I'm like, you know, no fighting experience whatsoever. Like all his technique, when it became real, got tossed out the window because he's never used it. He, in a controlled environment, he can make everything look beautiful and make it effective and pin and hurt. But when it all came down to it, he wasn't capable because he never had the practical application. So that's what I feel is the biggest problem with all martial arts in general. Um, but, um, but mostly a lot of the classical martial arts that they don't do real application. Does that make sense? No, that totally makes sense. And do you think like, uh, how do we get to there? Do you think competing uh, is, would be good? More, com uh, more Nimpo people competing? I know you have your own tournament circuit. Yeah, yeah. Um, maybe you talk a little bit about that and plug that. Okay, well, right now it's, not going on. Right. It's not so, going you know, on. So, like, we, we don't even know when we're going to be back. In fact, one gym that we usually would rent just told us for the entire year they're not going to be renting the gym. So, we don't even know if we're going to have another tournament unless we find later in the fall uh, something going on. But, but yeah, so here's some aspects. So, so let's say a tournament, um, and, and I make my students do at least one tournament a year, whether it's my own inter-school tournament or it's an out-of-school tournament. I want them to at least compete. And the reason why is because I want them to push their comfort zone. You probably, if you listen to Tony Robbins, he talks about a comfort zone. And he says, people jump out of their comfort zone, get a taste and jump right back in. They don't do it enough to be able to expand their comfort zone. They just get their foot wet and they go, oh, it's cold. And they put their foot right back out of the water, right? right. So we, we want our students to do more. Um, and we want them to train more. So a tournament is probably that little level that I talked about of Ron Dory, where they get a more realistic experience because they're taken out of their comfort zone. They're doing things in front of a crowd. They're doing things under duress and pressure where their nerves and their mind gets the best of them. That's one great aspect of it. And then fighting in the ring um, is a whole nother game, right? So that you're fighting against a live opponent where they're doing moves and you have to counter and move and all that other stuff, which is part of Ron Dory, whether we do it in jujitsu and grappling and, and so on. So that's important. So yes, tournaments are, I think is a good thing for people to do, but there are some people that they go, nah, I don't want to compete. It's not why I joined the school. It's not something that I'm looking for. And I go, but you should do it. And you know, not everyone, they'll hide and, and, and say they're gonna and then they don't. And I can only help them if they allow me to, you know what right. I mean? Push them. Right. Um, you know, with the current state of COVID-19, uh, you know, how are you, how are you guys holding up? I know you guys are doing online training, uh, just like I am. Yeah. Um, and a lot of people believe you can't learn on online, which I totally disagree. Um, I think, uh, because I know 70% of my own personal training has been on my own, right. um, studying books, watching videos, yeah. things like that. Yeah. Um, so, you know, let's talk a little bit about that and how your school is doing with the. Whole yeah. Well, I, I, I have to say that we probably have 60% of our enrollment still engaged in on live interactive classes. Um, so that's a good thing. Right. But there's 40% of the people who just threw in the towel right away. And then there are people, as we continue, like we talked about it before we actually went live, where I think we did, or I might have been thinking of the interview I did beforehand. Um, but uh, 
as time goes by, they get discouraged with the live classes. And then they say, well, parents will say, ah, you know, my son doesn't want to do it anymore. And I'm like, okay, you're going to let him quit so that he could sit in his room and play, you know, whatever game that he plays all day long and, and right. get fat and out of shape and lazy and lethargic and depressed. Right, because schools are not going to open until probably next year. Yeah, so you know what's interesting, though, and this is a pretty interesting thing, is that um, parents will, and, and even adults, they'll come to the martial arts school because they want to learn something, self-discipline, self-esteem, focus, control, get in better shape, all the industry buzzwords that we use in the martial arts, right? And, um, and the great thing is, is that when we have them in a controlled environment in our dojo, we could really block out all the outside influence, you know, noise, parents talking, all this stuff. And we have a better control system. We could get them to focus more, right? Then um, now we take them and we put them in a Zoom room and the parents are like, okay. And I mean, you probably experienced this. Three parents sitting on the couch while the kid, and they're watching the class while the kid's there. And, you know, a, a brother's in the other room playing piano and like at full blast. And, and they're going like, I don't understand why my kid's not focused. I'm like, because you put everything in there to distract him. You know, like they don't have the tools. They, and, and by the way, I don't blame them. I'm not even saying that they're irresponsible in any way. I'm basically saying though that they don't have the tools. They don't know any better. Like, so they need to get a controlled environment. And I'm trying to educate my clientele on that. In fact, I'm writing an article about it right now on how to get the best home training environment ever. But you're right though, Zoom classes have made my students better. The ones that are doing it are learn, learning how to two-dimensionally focus on a TV screen, right. see the move, transcribe it in their mind and actually practice it. I teach a program I don't teach my student who's a blind uh, martial artist. His name is Sensei Devin. He runs the Third Eye Insight. He hasn't been doing it right now, but he would teach blind students. And we'd come in and teach, and I would verbally explain the technique, and they would do it like that, right? And then I'd have my students alongside of them who could see it, could hear it, and, and, and feel it, and they couldn't get it because they're – the mindset is that they, you know, their mind gets confused, but, you know, you take out one of those sensory areas like visual and their mind works harder. So that proves to me that you have to have a better environment for your kids to train in, in, in the Zoom classes, right? And you need to yeah. make sure that they don't have outside distractions, that they're prepared for class. They get dressed in their full uniform. I'm forever telling a parent, parent, he needs to put his uniform on right now. You can't be in the classroom right now without a uniform. There's no different at home than it was in the class. Like, why do you think it's different? Like, we got to still continue with the discipline, how to tie their belt, how to focus. So we're keeping that same stringent set of requirements on the Zoom classes. And the parents, of course, that hate it probably will disappear. But the ones that love it for who we are, they're going to say, you know what? He's right. Let's get this back into their lives. That right. kind of thing. Yeah. And I always tell the parents, um, this, you know, they, your kids need a sense of normal uh, normalcy right now yeah. because you know and kids need structure you yeah. know when they're and you notice i i always notice uh classes are more hectic during the summer because they're out of school right so, you know their their minds are just all over the place all day right. right versus when they're in school uh or academic school you know and they come to my dojo afterwards right they are more focused you know what i mean yeah absolutely so, they they need structure you know yep. doesn't everyone though when you think about it even adults they need structure the bad part about being an adult is no one tells you what to do anymore right right so sadly like uh you know that part of the freedom that we experience is our downfall and i'll give you a perfect example when people are in the military they're they're told what to do from the minute they wake up till the time that they get a break and then they have a little bit of free time you know to go to the mess hall and eat and maybe exercise on their own but then they're back to structure those people are highly functioning successful when they're in the program and they might do years in the military and come out and you would think like oh my god i want that military guy working for me and i've hired a bunch of military guys thinking that way to find out they are the most irresponsible people they wake up late they show up late they don't do their job because they're no longer told what to do they didn't develop how to do it and how to develop a mental discipline they were forced to and within the the structure of it they functioned great but when they had freedom to do what they wanted they couldn't and that's why just highly successful people in business don't mean that they're highly successful parents you know um just because they know how to do something doesn't mean they actually apply it right 
Um, so, so that's why we come in and we become that discipline for them. And that's why a lot of the Zoom classes are not succeeding for certain kids because they don't have that structure at home anymore. The parents just don't know how to do it. Right. I, I agree. Um, so we got a couple questions um, yeah. before we sign off here. Um, Omar said, I'd like to hear Shihan's thoughts on how American ninjutsu is different from Japanese ninjutsu as the ex-cons are currently teaching it. Um, I'm going to have to really skate on this one, you know, like, so I don't really push anybody's buttons. So, <laughs> so being that I'm so uniquely able to say I've trained in, in all, in both of them. Um, what I can say is that the American ninjutsu art is much more of a amalgamation and a collection of American martial arts. So in other words, I think what happened was when people if they really trained in Japan and brought it back to the United States, they had a limited knowledge and then they lost track of their connection with their teacher. So then they started to take what they saw as ninjutsu and put it back together. Right. Very similar to the MMA, right? So MMA is basically a reverse triangle. If you look at a triangle like this and the top of the triangle, let's say is jujitsu and ninjutsu in Japan, right? And then from it broke off many systems, karate, Aikido, Judo, and they started to eliminate and change things until it got down to the bottom part of the pyramid where maybe they just did kicking and punching, maybe they just did grappling, maybe they just did weapons, right? And, and what at the top of the pyramid was everything. They did every part of the martial art, mental, spiritual, physical, weaponry, everything, healing, poisons, all of it here, now became one little tiny aspect at the bottom. Now, once the MMA started in the early days, they said, wow, a karate guy gets beat up by a jujitsu guy and a boxer gets annihilated by a jujitsu guy because the ground game was the most dominant force where you could submit someone. So what they did was they started to put the triangle back together. They reversed it. And now the, a, a guy at the bottom part of the MMA triangle knows how to do stand up fighting, ground fighting, you know, hand to hand stuff and boxing drills. And they started putting it back together. Fortunately, ninjutsu was all of that. Now, with that being said, I found that the American ninjutsu side was more of like a, a collection of American karate, jujitsu, and so on versus the traditional Japanese martial arts. And when I went to Japan, I saw an extreme difference, just our postures, the hand motions, the, the way a lock was done differently to make it more effective, um, the, the terminology, the history, the culture, it's, you know, for me, that was everything. For some, it doesn't matter. They could care less about all the stuff I just ma ma uh, men mentioned. But in Japan, I was like blown away by the culture, the, the reasons behind it all. And it made my art that much more impactful. Very cool. Good, cool, uh, good feedback. Um, we have another question from Chris. Uh, he asked, uh, what is something that seems to have been generally lost in training uh, from Shihan's early days compared to now? Um, well, I don't know if I've lost anything, but if you talk to my old school students to the new ones, they'll tell you the stories of being thrown on the hardwood floor and getting the crud kicked out of them versus now where we baby step people into their harder core training. But I don't think that most of my modern day students could have lasted in the old day training. I don't think they have the mindset for it anymore. And I don't know if that desire is still there, but also think it's society too. Um, for a period of time in my school, it, it was really not about learning how to defend yourself. People weren't afraid of or fearful of getting hurt, getting in a fight. Defend now it's getting a little bit more violent where we're starting to say, oh my God, we better learn how to defend ourselves. Home invasions, you know, attacks on the street. You know, you have a difference of political opinion. Someone will punch you in the face over it, you know, like subway attacks. So now it's the self-defense aspect is becoming more and more real. So I think it's kind of circling back around, but I do think that that was the difference of the two. Um, so uh, I try to teach that, but I'm also too, as, a, as an older instructor now, much more compassionate. You know, like I cringe if my guys are doing high dive rolls over a pad because I'm fearful that they may hurt themselves. Or I'm like, ease up, ease up, don't punch each other that hard in the face. You know, like I don't want them to hurt each other and go home with a broken nose. So, but back in the day, I'm like, yeah, good. That's how it should be. You know, you want to go, your lip is bleeding. You got a good workout. Don't be a baby. Right. 
Right. Like one time I was experiencing a funny story, uh, internal bleeding. I, it's it just, I'd cough and sometimes there was blood. So I went to my teacher, Osensei Vasquez, and I said, you know, Shion at the time, um, I'm experiencing internal bleeding. You know, I was hoping for the Mr. Miyagi, let's mix up this little thing and you drink this and you'll be better. He's like, don't be a baby. <laughs> and, I, and I waited and he's like, now get out, you know, and he kicked me out of his office. And, and then he went, talked to, other, and I got hit like twice as much in the stomach that day, almost like he was going to temper me. So I'd stop having internal bleeding. It turned out being something totally unrelated to contact, but um, I didn't get the answer I was quite looking for. Great. That's great. Yeah. Um, so uh, one last quick question. Uh, like, what's your favorite bouge in ninjutsu? Like, you know, do you, like for me, uh, the sword is my favorite. Yeah. You know, uh, so what about you? Um. I think that weaponry wise, I love um, definitely, you know, Beacon Jitsu sword, sword work. Um, I also am really fond of the Hanbo and the bow. Um, and uh, I like knife edged weapons because that kind of comes from my training with Tuhan Sayak as well. But I would say my f four, and I'm holding up three fingers, the first weapon is Katana, second weapon is, is Hanbo, and, and third is bow. And then the fourth is firearms and tactical training where um, I've always trained in, in, you know, that kind of stuff as well, because I know there's a realistic side to that also. Um, as far as empty hands go, I believe that uh, everything has to be well-rounded, but um, I love the aspects of uh, control, close quarter combat type training, um, you know, and uh, also the grappling aspect, whether it be standing wrist locks or groundwork. So those are two very important aspects that people don't like. And, um, you know, but I, as far as that, I think those are my main ones. Awesome. Thank you very much for sharing that. Um, well, this has been a pretty great conversation and uh, we got done in time. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So. I um, I, I warned you I could talk. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for joining in uh, today. Um, this was a great experience and uh, hopefully we get to do this again soon. But uh, we have Shihan Ali Abarigo from Long Island Jiu Jitsu Centers. Been yeah. In martial arts for uh, 30 Forever. years. Been, been doing martial arts for 50 years, you know. Um, yeah. Crazy stuff. Uh, thank you so much for joining us today. Yeah, my pleasure. By the way, if I could just plug one selfless plug, if anyone's interested and they're interested in buying, I have a bunch of books out there. Um, they could get them on Amazon and I think they're downloadable. If not, they could reach out to me and I could send them. I have a book called the um, 21st Century Ninjutsu, A Warrior's Mindset, which is kind of all the stories that I've gone through in my life and my training, what American ninjutsu to Japanese ninjutsu. And then I wrote another book called The Five Gateways to Happiness. It's a small 60 page book, tiny, quick read. I wrote it about four years ago. It's, it's sold in I think about like 32 countries so far. That means that people from one person from those 32 places bought my book, but I have, have a bunch of people that have read it. And it's really all about enhancing your happiness, not you're un, unhappy and this is how to become happy, but you could be the happiest person in the world. And this book has like certain little things in it to enhance your happiness. But I, I just have those out there. I love sharing. And I do a lunchtime chat every Thursday at 1230 on my Facebook page called Lunchtime, lunchtime Chat with Allie, where I just talk about spiritual things, mindset change. And that was my dedication to give back to the world, to try to keep the positivity flowing through. Even in a dark time or a good time, I just want to share with others. So that's right. what I have going on. And I appreciate you, by the way. Um, thanks for sharing this you know, video. Thanks for asking me, which I feel honored and privileged. And um, I hope that when we're able to get back to hand coming and training in place, you'll bring your students out to train with me. And maybe I could come out and visit you and, um, and Mark sensei as well. And um, I just love that we have a good connection because us ninjutsu guys have to stick together. I, I agree. And a lot of people don't know that Mark sensei was a student of yours. Uh, so my teacher was a student of yours for a little while as well. Yeah. And I'm honored that he even says that because, you know, yeah, I introduced him to the Genbukan arts because my teacher, Tani Muda Sensei, said help him along. And I did. And then unfortunately, I had left while he was getting ramped up. So he stayed long after I was gone um, and continued his quest, which is amazing. Um, but uh, yeah, I feel privileged that he even mentions that. I would never mention that because he's a high ranking teacher and I wouldn't say that, but I'm honored that he mentioned that. It makes me feel good. So thank you for mentioning that again. Yeah, no problem. You know, awesome. if, if anyone's in the New York area uh, and you want to learn this special, special 
you know, Japanese art that we study and train in, you need to contact Ali. He has a beautiful school, two locations actually, yeah. two different areas. You need to get a hold of him, train in jitsu and have a great experience. Thank you very much. I appreciate it. Arigato. Arigato gozaimashita. Okay. Koitashimaste. Sayonara. Sayonara. Bye.